Coming up on this Tuesday edition of Daybreak, with the debate raging over taxes and welfare, President Park Geun-hye reiterates she's against raising taxes. Critics say the president's stance on the issue is unrealistic. Korea's finance minister says the nation's easy monetary and fiscal policy stance will likely continue this year, while the government pushes ahead with structural reforms to ensure long-term growth. Plus, U.S. President Barack Obama says Washington might send lethal arms to Ukraine if diplomacy fails to end the crisis. Daybreak begins now. Hello, thanks for joining us to our viewers around the world. It's 6am on Tuesday, February 10th here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom and you're tuned in to Daybreak. And we begin with the ongoing deliberations over whether to raise taxes to pay for Korea's welfare programmes. President Park Geun-hye waded into the debate yet again on Monday, saying no new taxes are necessary, stressing instead that the issue can be solved through economic revitalisation. But her stance quickly drew sharp criticism across party lines. Our Ji Myung-gil reports. President Park Geun-hye has voiced her opposition to raising taxes in order to fund welfare programs. She said Monday that economic revitalization is the key to making up for any revenue shortfall for welfare and that it will also help create jobs and raise tax revenue. Since Park's administration came into office in 2013, her government has been dogged by questions about whether it could deliver on a key campaign pledge to provide expensive welfare programs without raising taxes. She has even drawn criticism from her own ruling Senuri party, which views her stance on the issue as unrealistic. Critics argue that the government is trying to squeeze more money out of ordinary wage earners. In recent months, the government has raised cigarette prices and introduced a revised tax settlement scheme, drawing fire for both from the general public. Adding fuel to the fire, the main opposition party's newly elected chairman, Moon Jae-in, vowed to fight against President Park's policies on his first day in the post. I will stand against President Park Geun-hye's hidden motives to raise the taxes of ordinary citizens. I will go against plans to limit welfare expansion. Moon pledged to raise the corporate tax rate and withdraw tax cuts for the rich in order to establish what he described as a fair tax system. The ruling party responded by saying it will gather opinions from inside the party and continue to communicate with the opposition party on tax-related issues. Jim Young-gil, Arirang News. The United States has reiterated that it welcomes dialogue with North Korea, but only when the regime shows it is serious about denuclearization. Speaking to reporters in Seoul on Monday, U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Tony Blinken said it was important to sustain international solidarity in pressuring North Korea. On the question of deploying an integral part of a U.S. missile defense system called THAAD to South Korea, a very controversial issue. He said no decision has been made yet. This is Blinken's first overseas trip as the Deputy Secretary of State. And he's the third uh, senior U.S. official to visit South Korea in uh, recent weeks. Now, Russia has moved to defuse concerns. Kim Jong-un's planned visit to Moscow in May could negatively affect relations between Russia and China. Nor the North Korean leader is expected to travel to the Russian capital for an event marking the 70th anniversary of the Soviet Union's victory over Nazi Germany in World War II. Now, Russian ambassador to China, Andrei Denisov, says Kim's attendance is natural and logical as Korea fought hard against Japan to be liberated. 
Uh, there had been concerns Beijing would be unhappy with the apparent snub by Kim as North Korean leaders traditionally travel to China before they visit other countries. Denisov noted that Chinese President Xi Jinping was one of the first guests to RSVP and the North Korean leader is just one of 20 leaders that have accepted Moscow's invitation thus far. The ambassador added that Russia and China have common goals in maintaining peace and stability in the Asia-Pacific region and on North Korea's denuclearization and also on improving ties with both Koreas. President Park Geun-hye is weighing various diplomatic factors before deciding whether she will attend that World War II anniversary ceremony in Russia in May. South Korea's unification minister, Ryu Kil-jae, said that current sanctions against uh, Russia for its involvement in the Ukraine crisis must be taken into consideration before any decision is made. The government also needs to consult with relevant ministries and allies before responding to the invitation. Numerous heads of state, including, as we just mentioned, the leaders of both South and North Korea, have been invited to Russia to mark Russia's or the Soviet Union's defeat of Nazi Germany in World War II. Korea's finance minister says the government will likely maintain its easy monetary and fiscal policy stance this year as it uh, pushes through structural reforms that will hopefully ensure some long-term growth for the country. Speaking with Reuters in Istanbul on Monday ahead of the G20 finance ministers and central bank governors meeting, Che Kyung Hwan said the government has identified labour, education, and the financial and public sectors as the main areas to reform so that Korea can avoid dropping into a drawn-out period of sluggish growth. The minister noted that Korea's key interest rate is already at a historic low of 2% and this will continue for the time being. Korea's finance chief also called on other G20 economies to beef up their policy coordination, saying that countries following monetary policies only to boost their own competitiveness does not help the world economy. And uh, for five straight years now, the tax burden on Korean households has risen at a faster pace than household income. But corporate taxes, big business, uh, have been paying less tax than they have in previous years. Uh, Hwang Jae reports on the growing burden, not really on businesses, but on ordinary families. The tax burden for Korean households outpaced income gains by nearly double in the first three quarters last year. Data from Statistics Korea shows the average monthly income of a household with more than two members stood at around 4,000 U.S. dollars, up more than three and a half percent from a year ago. But households' average monthly spending on taxes rose almost six percent to around 140 dollars. The trend of households' tax burden increasing at a faster pace than their income has been an ongoing issue since 2010. And because tax expenditures exclude indirect taxes like value-added dues that households pay as they spend money to buy products, the actual tax burden on them is heavier. It's no surprise then that national income tax revenues collected mostly from ordinary citizens are on the rise. Korea's national income tax revenue has risen for the past two years since 2012, while corporate tax revenues were on a downward trend during the period. Although the government points to the sluggish economy at home and abroad for the low corporate tax revenues, experts say it should seek ways to create tax equity. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Now, falling global oil prices are having a mixed impact on the uh, Korean economy. But one group that is hurting for sure is the construction uh, sector. And with many firms targeting overseas clients in the Middle East, the road ahead looks to be a tricky one. Uh, Shin Semin reports. Korean overseas construction industry is hurting after seeing its earnings fall for the first time in four years. 
The Bank of Korea says the current account surplus from overseas construction dropped to 17 billion U.S. dollars last year, down 16 percent from the previous year. It's the first drop since 2010 when earnings fell nearly 18 percent. The balance of overseas contracts includes the payments that Korean builders have received for the progress made on existing orders from overseas. The decline in revenue is largely attributed to falling global oil prices, as a large portion of Korean construction firms are located in oil-producing countries in the Middle East. Experts say the oil price drop will be a troubling factor for many Korean builders looking for overseas deals, as it is hard to predict how long the current low oil prices will last. Korea's overseas construction industry has seen steady growth since 2010 from nearly 12 billion that year to 20 billion dollars in 2013. The data says that the number had been rising by a yearly average of 20 percent. Korean builders, however, secured 66 billion dollars in overseas construction projects last year alone, the second highest total in history, but still short of the government's initial target of 70 billion. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Samsung has been ranked the third most reputable company in the United States, following supermarket chain Wegmans Food Markets and on online retailer Amazon. The annual report by the U.S. market researcher Harris Pohl focuses on corporate reputation. Samsung was the only non-American firm that made it into the top ten, outperforming all other tech firms, including Apple and Google. Samsung's steady climb was attributed to high ratings from consumers for its key products and services. The world's stock market capitalization has hit an 11-year high. The Korea Exchange says the global stock market was valued at 63.5 trillion US dollars as of the end of 2014, which is up nearly 6% from a year earlier. The Asia-Pacific region gained the most at 14 percent, followed by the Americas. The European region, which includes uh, the Middle East and Africa, uh, on the other hand, saw its market cap edge down nearly 9 percent. The Americas accounted for nearly half of the global stock market cap, while the Asia-Pacific region held about one-third. Korea's stock market was valued at $1.2 trillion dollars, or about 2% of the world's total market cap. Now, with the demanding academic and working schedules of a great many Koreans, getting a decent night's sleep can be uh, often low down on the priority list. And what we know is, in this always-on society we live in, Koreans are sleeping less and worse, and for some it is getting so bad that they require special treatment. Our Kim ji reports. Hunched shoulders, dark circles under droopy eyelids, excessive yawning. These are telltale signs of sleep deprivation, a common condition among Koreans. The national sleep average is less than eight hours, the lowest among OECD member countries. So what's keeping them up at night? I sleep for three to four hours a day during the academic semester. I feel dizzy all day, so I try to get fresh air from time to time and try to sleep while commuting. These days I sleep like five hours because of night culture in, in Korea. My company has a lot of meetings and conferences and after that we go drinking and so it's really hard to go sleep. If aroma candles and counting sheep don't work, what can one do to get a good night's rest? Specialized medical centers have popped up in recent years to help, like this clinic in downtown Seoul. Quality shot eye is important for the brain, says the clinic's doctor. While we're sleeping, the brain helps the body dump out waste, making way for a fresh start the following morning. Sleep deprivation is truly detrimental to the body. The immune system will start to fail, inducing all sorts of diseases, including arrhythmia, diabetes, and stroke. It's important to ask for help and receive treatment, particularly for those suffering from insomnia for more than three months. Physical and psychological methods are often used to help insomnia patients. Those suffering from sleep apnea may get help from a surgical procedure. For others, a five- to eight-week program to change cognitive and behavioral patterns could be the ticket to reclaiming those precious sleep hours. Kim Jeong, Arirang News.
time now for a look through the global headlines. We're following this uh, Tuesday morning here from Seoul, Korea. For that, we turn to Eunice Kim, standing by the news center for us. Good morning, Eunice. And good morning to you, Mark. Several hours ago, German Chancellor Angela Merkel held talks with her U.S. counterpart at the White House. And at the top of their agenda was an appropriate response to the escalating crisis in Ukraine. Now, despite their differing stances on arming Kiev's forces, the two world leaders showed an agreeable front. If, in fact, diplomacy fails, what I've asked my team to do is to look at all options. What other means can we put in place uh, to change Mr. Putin's calculus? Uh, and the possibility of lethal defensive weapons is one of those options that's being examined. But I have not made a decision about that yet. I have given you my opinion, but you may rest assured that no matter what we decide, the alliance between the United States and Europe will continue to stand, will continue to be solid, even though on certain issues we may not always agree. Washington has been mulling over the prospect of sending lethal aid to Ukraine amid pressure from Republicans and the advance of pro-Russian separatists in eastern Ukraine. But Chancellor Merkel, who meets Russian, Put Russian President Vladimir Putin tomorrow in four-way talks, has been vocally against the move. The crisis in Ukraine has so far claimed more than 5,300 lives and displaced 1.5 million people from their homes. Meanwhile, in Germany, Vice Chancellor and Economy Minister Sigmar Gabriel has flatly rejected Greece's call for World War II reparations incurred by the Nazis. At a gathering of his Social Democrats on Monday, the minister said the likelihood it would honor the calls recently made by the Greek Prime Minister was zero. He went on to say that all issues had been settled when the two former Germany signed a treaty with the Allies in 1990. Nearly seven Seventy years later, the Third Reich had uh, forced, nearly 70 years earlier, rather, the Third Reich had forced the Greek Central Bank to issue a loan that had financially ruined the country. Sources in Athens put the outstanding debt at about 183 billion U.S. dollars. Now, more deadly strikes by the Nigerian militant group Boko Haram, this time in neighboring Cameroon and Niger. Sources say at least 20 people and as many as 30 were kidnapped when the militants hijacked a bus in northern Cameroon and drove it toward the Nigerian border. In two separate incidents in Niger, a car bomb was set off and a prison stormed overnight as the country's parliament was preparing a cross-border offensive against the group. Recently, Nigeria's general elections was postponed to March 28th from February 14th amid security and logistical concerns tied to Boko Haram. And finally, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is enjoying higher approval ratings following the country's hostage crisis that ended in a war correspondent and self-styled security consultant being publicly slayed by the IS group. The country's largest daily, Yomiuri Shimbun, found that support for Abe had grown to 58 percent from the 53 percent measured in January. Kyoto's poll found that more than 80, more than 60 percent rather, said they approved of the government's response to the hostage crisis. Both dailies had a majority of their respondents agree with Tokyo's plans to continue humanitarian aid to IS-affected regions. And a good Tuesday morning to you all. Now, as of this Monday, there are exactly uh, three years left until the 2018 Winter Olympics kicks off here in Korea in the mountainous city of Pyeongchang. So how much of the preparation work has been completed and what still needs to be done for a successful event? Well, Connie Lee has more. For those of you counting down, the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics is exactly three years away. Come February 9th, 2018, the high-profile competition will kick off in Gangwon-do province with top athletes aiming for gold. 
While it still seems a long way off, in actuality, the clock is ticking for Korea as it must complete all preparations a year before the games open. With budget and environmental issues looming, the question is whether Korea will be ready in time. So far, only around a 10 percent of work has been done on the six new facilities being built for the Olympics. And the funds received from sponsors to bankroll construction only make up 15 percent of the goal of about 730 million U.S. dollars needed. Meanwhile, citizens of Gangwon-do are up in arms about money being wasted, especially the combined 219 million U.S. dollars being used on the speed skating rink and an ice hockey rink, which will be dismantled after the 17-day event. As for facilities that are set to be used afterwards, like the 12,000-seater figure skating rink, with no concrete plans for how the venue will be put to use, local residents aren't exactly excited about adding another rink to the five they already have. Pyeongchang officials say Korea will be ready in time, but hopes linger that more practical plans will be implemented soon enough. Connie Lee, Arirang News. Now, moving on, Spider-Man's uncle, Uncle Ben, once said, with great power comes great responsibility. Well, I say with a great predecessor comes an even greater responsibility as manager Shin Tae-yong held his inauguration press conference on Monday. Now, with head coach Lee Gwang-jung resigning from his post as the head coach of the Olympic football team due to leukemia, the now former national team assistant coach held a press conference on Monday at the KFA headquarters. Now there, he talked about the burden of filling in for Lee Gwang-jung, but added that he'll use the former head coach as an inspiration to qualify for the Rio Summer Games in 2016. Now, having coached under Uli Schilke for several months now, expectations are high for head coach Shin Tae-yong. Now, speaking of burdens, when you have a title like Super Rookie, there's a pressure to win your first title. Well, not for these former KLPGA stars, apparently, including Kim Se-young, who already won her first LPGA Tour title. Now, it didn't come easy with all the wind at the Pure Silk Bahamas LPGA Classic, though, as she went into a sudden death playoff hole against fellow Korean Yu Son Young and Thailand's Arya Jonengarn. But after a birdie in the first playoff hole, she claims her first LPGA Tour title, giving Korea their second title in two tournaments this season. Meanwhile, with Park Bee finishing a stroke ahead of Lydia Ko, the fight for the top world ranking remains closer than ever. And while Kim Se-young is having a great 2015 season so far, 2015 really hasn't been so great for Olympic swimmer Park Tae-hwan, who's currently involved in a doping scandal. And although it seems like all signs are pointing to him unknowingly receiving these shots, that doesn't seem to matter for the Korea Swimming Federation. Now, with the nomination and winners of the 2014 Korea Swimming Federation Athlete of the Year honors being announced, Park Tae-hwan was left off the shortlist amid the ongoing investigation with this doping scandal. Now, Park, who won one silver and five bronze medals and set a Korean medal record with 20 last season during the Incheon Asian Games, was the clear favorite. But with the latest incident, two divers will receive the top honors in Uharam and Park Hambyeol. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Good morning. A sudden heavy snowfall gripped the metro area yesterday, causing chaos for the evening commuters. And this morning is kicking off much milder, but still on the negative side, which means slick spots and icy roads are possible out there. So be sure to drive with extra caution and leave early. But thankfully, severe cold snap we had for the last couple of days will finally break today. Also, partly to mostly sunny skies are in store throughout the day across the nation and right now the level of fine dust are in the normal range but it could go up higher as the day goes on so please bear that in mind and let's take a closer look at the readings for today uh, the low in Seoul is kicking off at minus three which is 10 degrees higher than the same time
second yesterday. Then the afternoon high will climb up to five, and Daegu and Busan will peak at 11, and Gwangju will top out at nine this afternoon. Now let's see how other regions are looking. It looks like Jeju Island and Daejeon will rise to nine and seven respectively, and Dukdo will top out at six. Again, be extra careful out on the roads, and hope you have a wonderful start to the day. And it's time to take a look at the international weather for beers around the world. Well, that's going to do it for now. Korea Today is coming up at the top of the hour, half an hour's time. Have a wonderful day. Goodbye.